Have you seen the uh, hit cable show, um, Man vs. Food? Have you seen that? It stars um, Adam Richman. It's kind of a cult favorite right now. Um, premise is real simple. He goes to one of these places in the United States where they say, if you will eat this giant steak, then you get this T-shirt, you know. And so he goes to these places, and, and I mean, it's, it's kind of like food pornography, I would call it, because it's, it's all this gross, really gross stuff and masses of it. And it's like you know, he's actually gotten really sick sometimes. He fasts the day before. He works out intensely that week. He doesn't eat anything the day after, but the amount of, of carbs and the amount of sugar and the fat that he takes into his body, if he was not strong, would actually kill him. And it's, it's just this show, of, I mean, um, one early episode, he ate a hamburger that was about the size of a stool cushion. Uh, another time, he ate 180 oysters in one setting. Um, he ate this pile of extremely five uh, pepper hot uh, chicken wings. I mean, he just eats these things that are, sound ridiculous. Ate two gallons of ice cream one time. And he says the key to the show's success is, he says, it's accessibility. He says, because not everybody can play basketball like Kobe Bryant, but we can all do some pretty significant damage to a delicious meal. Everybody can eat. And he says, I think that at our hungriest or sometimes at our most inebriated, people surprise themselves at what they're able to eat. I was the first man versus food. I don't, this, this hasn't hit... It was kind of boy versus food. I, I'm still waiting for my checks, my royalty checks to come in. But uh, when I was a kid, uh, about 15, 16 years old, I used to create all these concoctions of hamburgers. And this is before they became popular. And I remember one time taking the hamburger. You know, they, they didn't even have double hamburgers. McDonald's just had single hamburgers. But took, and I put a big, great big hamburger patty and then I took a hot dog and fried the hot dog and cut the hot dog up and put that on top of that. You're right. And then I took bacon and put bacon on top of that. That was the original bacon burger dog. You may have heard of this. You know, like I said, I should get some money from the franchises. Now you go and you, you get a, a hamburger and they're like this big. And, you know, I put potato chips on mine. That was one the next step. And you just keep getting it bigger and bigger until you almost have to kind of get TMJ or dislocate your jaw to, to get that thing in your mouth. And, and now you can go to Hardee's or any place and they got all that junk there. You know, they just pour this stuff on top. Wow. So we travel with Jesus through these 40 days of fasting and temptation. We come to the first of the three temptations, and this is appetite. Matthew 4, 1 through 4. Then the Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness so that the devil might tempt him. And after Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was starving. The tempter came to him and said, Since you are God's Son, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus replies, it is written, people won't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. Would you know it? Jesus is hungry. It's, it's, that's the old translations. The newer ones are more correct. They say he starved 40 days without eating, 40 days of fasting. It's then that Satan comes to him and he says, you know, you think you're the son of God. So turn these stones into bread. You can just go abracadabra. And the stone becomes bread, and your hunger is satisfied. He says, if you are really the Son of God, notice that phrase in there. He had just come out of being baptized in the Jordan, where he heard those words, this is my Son, my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And so the tempter goes off that declaration. He says that you can meet all your needs, all you do is to turn this uh, rock into Panera, and you are the man. Jesus quotes scripture back to him, and what, what he quotes is insightful because it's um, part of the last sermon that Moses gave as those tribes, you know, hundreds of years before this had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and they're about to go into the promised land, and they'd been tested for 40 years, and Moses says this to them. It's from Deuteronomy 8, 2 and verse 3. He says, remember the long road on which he, 
on which the Lord your God led you during the 40 years in the desert so he could humble you, testing you to find out what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandment or not. So that's why you've been in the wilderness. God is testing you to find out really what's in your heart. And he says why you're tested. He wanted to find out really what their core was. And God was about to give them all of these blessings. They were going to go into the promised land. You're going to be, he said, you're going to be staying in cities you didn't build, homes you didn't build. You're going to be eating grapes that came from vineyards that you didn't plant, that you didn't harvest. And before I give you these things, all of this abundance, I need to know what's in your heart. Do you really trust God? Moses goes on, verse 3, he says, He humbled you by making you hungry and then feeding you the manna that, that neither you nor your ancestors ancestors had ever experienced so he could teach you that people don't live on bread alone no they live based on what the lord says that's deuteronomy 8 3 that jesus had quoted back to satan so moses reminds them of this manna the manna was this bread that appeared in the morning they went out every day except for saturday their sabbath and it was there and they would take this stuff in it was their substance for 40 years they were in a desert. They had to depend on God. And they were about to enter the promised land. And God wants to make sure that they trust him, that they know how to depend on him. And so Moses and Jesus say, in essence, he says, the word of the Lord is more important than bread, than your appetite, than things. The most important thing in life is what he's telling them is not consumption, the most important thing in life is pleasing God. That's kind of a paraphrase of what's been said there. Now today we have what's called, I would call, appetitis. It's a little word that I coined, but it just means this disease where we are slowly dying because of our enormous appetites. Our appetites are huge. Our, our culture is obsessed with consuming. It's a sport. It's almost an occupation. Uh, most people know no boundaries. Uh, we want what we want, and we get what we want, and it just, just isn't about food. It's about everything. Um, it's about technology and sex and clothing and cars and entertainment. And yesterday's luxuries become today's necessities, don't they? Just in a little bit of time. Twenty years ago, if you had a cell phone, it was this big, Right? And it was just for extremely important people. Now, we think it's an absolute necessity. And that's the consumer soup that we are immersed in. Uh, we make fun of it. We may rail against it. And yet it affects us all. We're, we're pushed and we're pulled in our culture because of the wants that are perceived. And we think that we have to have it in order to be relevant. And that's the real temptation here, that Jesus would be relevant. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, a, an English writer at the same time as C.S. Lewis, said, fallacies do not cease to be fallacies because they become fashions. And that's the challenge that we have. And we, we talk about these things, and we rant about these things, about carbon footprint and how much we're consuming about conspicuous consumption and about how we throw away more food than what third world countries have to eat but we know all of that I mean that's where we are we, we know about appetite we, we know what it is each one of us to, to really want something and to think about it constantly so it's in our minds we've each one tried over and over maybe to try to stop doing something to curb our appetite and most of us that have tried it sometimes failed at, at doing that. And the message we usually hear is, well, just say no. You need to have some willpower. You need to just stop. Just say no. Just exert your willpower. Decide not to do it and just stop. And it sounds so simple when it's someone else. It's not so simple when it's us. And that's not what Jesus is saying. That's not what God is saying there. He's not saying, well, just stop it, just be strong. He's saying so much more. We do some crazy things for our appetite. I'm going to tell you a story. It's funny now. It wasn't funny at the time. 
but it sounds really funny now. Years ago, we lived in Illinois, as you know, and when I was really, really, really young and just a young father and we only had one child, there arose this terrible snowstorm. You know where I'm going now. She's already hanging her head. <laughs> She's embarrassed for me. There was this terrible snowstorm, and it was a whiteout for like two days, and it got down below zero for like minus 20 for a couple of weeks. And all of the roads were closed. Uh, the, the railroad was closed. All of the highways were closed. It was that bad. In the midst of that, I decided that I needed to go to town, which was two miles away, in order to get some milk for the baby. Okay, The baby was really going to need some milk. This was going to be a, a crisis if I didn't make my way into town to get the milk. What I really wanted wasn't milk. What I really was worried about was I was about out of cigarettes and beer. It was what the problem was. <laughs> so I took my four-wheel drive pickup truck that had chains all the way around on the tires, and I went out on the highway that was just a quarter of a mile from our house, two miles into town on a state road, you know, snow this deep, and I got the thing stuck out there where you could see it from the house. And then uh, I did the only reasonable thing to do. I went and got the biggest tractor that I could get and took the biggest tractor out there and got it stuck next to the, to the truck. And then I got the second biggest tractor and I took it out. And before I was done, I had two tractors and a truck stuck out in the middle of a state highway. True story. Not one that I'm extremely proud of, but Alongside the road there on Route 48 right now, if you would go there, there's a monument that says, <laughs> On this site in 1975, the weakest man on earth displayed himself in the most foolish exhibition of lack of willpower for all to see. This is a tribute to that man who one cold afternoon in January made us all feel like giants and heroes compared to him. He braved the elements for cigarettes and beer and forgot the milk. Next time you're in Illinois, you might go down Route 48. It's out there someplace. We know about appetite. Maybe your story is not that extreme. Maybe it's not that funny. But everybody has had an appetite and wanted something and done something kind of silly that we can look back on. And I, I have to ask myself and ask you the question, what would life look like? If you were really in control, if you never lost control of your appetite, if you had extreme willpower, what would your life look like? Have you ever thought about that? That you could do exactly what you wanted to do and you never did anything that you didn't want to do. Isn't that, you know, we don't even think about that. What would life be like? We could, what could you do? Uh, you would not be pushed around it's one important benefit, I think, from a, a godly fast that some of us are doing. We determine an area of life where our appetite is pushing us around and we purposely seek uh, power to abstain and to develop what used to be called prudence, was one of the four cardinal virtues that the church had, to stop doing things that actually hurt us. And I've heard some people sharing some of their stories uh, in the small group the other night and just one-on-one. -on -one. And some people have said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed that I see now that I'm really looking at this, what I was doing before I started paying attention to it. Because I see now that I was really kind of out of control. But now, once I've started paying attention to it, I see that. And others are saying, you know, um, this isn't fun at all. I failed the second day. I failed the third day. And, um, you know, I tried. And I just don't have any willpower. I just, I just can't do it, you know. And I want to say that fasting is not a test of our will. It really isn't. It has the purpose of lowering your resistance to God and to God's power in your life. And the first step is becoming aware, okay? That's the first step of your need. If the fast didn't go well, then you are aware. You are aware that I have a need here. And I, I'm not as strong, perhaps, as what I thought I was. That's not a failure. 
If you're like me at every failure, you know, Satan says, oh, well, you're, you're nothing, you're weak, you're, you're a failure, uh, you're never going to get any better, you're never going to overcome. Real Christians are able to do that, but you're not a real Christian like everyone else. You're just a faker. Have you ever had Satan tell you that? You're just a faker is all that he says, you see. You know, a real Christian can control him or herself. Consider yourself so privileged when you are accused. Consider yourself uh, really important in the kingdom of God when Satan accuses you and comes to you and says, you're nothing. You see, because you're important enough for him to fight you. So if you're moving in the right direction, you're going to be accused. You're going to be told that you're a failure and you might as well give up. You're intentionally moving in life towards God. And that's an important realization Step number one is, I am powerless. My own life has become unmanageable. And that's an important step. Our fasting is not just about giving something to us, but it's also receiving something from God. We fast, we recognize the difference between wants and needs. God, of course, will not give us what we want, but he will give us what we need. And that was the original message to those travelers in the wilderness is that for 40 years I have given you exactly what you needed. You have not received what you wanted, but I have given you everything that you need. And that's why God tested them. God was jealous, it says, for their hearts, teaching them to trust him, that he would provide for them. Our appetites have the danger of turning into God replacements. We think about them all the time. They occupy our time. We begin to order our lives around our appetites. I, I can't go there because there's a game that day. I'm sorry, you have to go to the wedding by yourself because there's a ball game that afternoon. Is there cell coverage where they are? Is, is, there, is there internet coverage there? I'm not sure that I can go to that retreat unless there's internet service or cell coverage. Our appetites begin to order our lives and they become, become God replacements. Ap appetites can morph into little gods and they never satisfy. Did you ever hear the story of the 14th century duke in what is now called Belgium, uh, Reynold III? Uh, he was grossly obese and his younger brother uh, launched a coup against him. And then what he did was he built in the castle, he built a room around this very enormous man, and he made the windows so, uh, and the doors so a normal-sized person could pass. But uh, for Ronald III, uh, he couldn't get through because he was so obese. And then what his younger brother did was every day he sent all these, these delicacies by the fattest foods, the choicest fare in the land, so to speak. He sent him plate after plate, and he got larger and larger. And when people would complain and say, you're keeping your brother captive in the castle, he says, there's no key on the door. He can leave any time he wants. All he needs to do is to lose some weight, and he can get out. True story. Went on for 10 years that way. But this man was captive by his own size. Finally, his brother was killed in battle, and they tore the room down and set him free, and he, he died a few months after that because of the, the health, the ill health that he had. But God doesn't want to ruin our appetite. He wants to change our taste buds. And following God is not about killing our desire. It's, it's rather about changing our appetites for things that really do satisfy. The reality is that we usually settle for cheap imitations, C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling ab about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. See, thing is that we may not know how to do that. Sometimes I think we preachers make it sound so easy. We say, well, just trust in God. Just abide in God. Just walk in Him. Just change your life. Make it sound so simple. Obedience to God is not so much about fear or willpower. It's, it's much more about trust. Researchers um, have long studied the human will. 
remember it was Plato that talked about the the uh, higher self and the lower self and that life was realized when the higher self overcame the lower self and uh, Freud had uh, the ego and the super ego and we say okay well what, what's that got to do with desires for God years ago at Stanford they had a um, test that is now known as the marshmallow test this is back in the 60s you probably heard of this what they did was they took a child, took many children, one by one, and they put them in a room by themselves with a table and a simple marshmallow in the middle of the table and told the child that if he or she would wait, that they would get more marshmallows. But if they didn't wait and just ate that marshmallow, that was going to be the only marshmallow that they would get. Pretty simple thing, right? Should try it with chocolate with us, right? Or light beer, who knows? But anyway... With these kids, that's what they did, and they found that some of the kids couldn't wait but like two, three minutes, and they'd nibble on the bottom of it and put it back down on the table so nobody could see it. Some kids just plopped it in their mouth immediately, and some kids were able to wait 12, 15 minutes and got the other marshmallow. Well, what's, what's uh, really good about this study back in 1966 is when they did it, is they went on and studied these kids for the rest of their lives. And what they found was the kids that could wait, that could delay, they had higher SAT scores, they had better relationships, better self-worth about themselves, and they were just amazed at the difference between the children that could wait and the children that couldn't wait. So, recently at the University of Rochester, they did that study again, and they supplemented it with something else. Before the marshmallow test was actually performed, what they did was they came in and they gave the child an artwork assignment. And they said, we want you to color this. And they gave him just an old box of beat-up crayons. And the crayons were obviously not up to the task that the kid needed to, to color this. And the adult would say, if you'll wait just a minute, uh, I'll go get some better crayons. Now, for half the kids, they returned with a nice new box of crayons for them to use. The other half, they came back and go, uh, I was wrong, we don't have any, just use those. What, what they found, th th then, they, then they executed the marshmallow test after that. What they found was that the kids that were promised the crayons, that never received the crayons, without fail, ate the marshmallow early. And the kids that had been promised the crayons and received them, could wait between 12 and 15 minutes. They passed the test. And they're still trying to get their heads around what this means about human nature and nurture and environment and genetics and all of this stuff. And I look at that and I, I think, this, this is just so simple. I mean, that was a secular test. But trust developed in a relationship is a huge motivator for, for developing our willpower. It really is. All that time in the wilderness, God was saying, trust me. God provided for him day after day. Every day he says, depend on me. Develop an appetite for what I want to give to you. You see, I will be faithful to you. And there is more to life than just bread. He said, my, my bread, my desire, my appetite is for God. I want to please God is what, where I want you to be. Today, I think God is saying to us, do you trust me? And we may be saying, well, I want to, but I, I'm not sure how. I've, I've never trusted anyone, really. See? Stop and think about it. Have you ever really trusted anyone? The, the world says, well, you should try harder. You should have more willpower. You should be a stronger person. And God says, well, let me change your appetite. Let, let me show you how to depend on me. Let, let me walk with you in this. He says, if you will abide in me, I'm going to empower you and you're going to be fruitful. Remember, one of the fruits of the Spirit was self-control. Remember, that doesn't happen overnight. It develops slowly. So this is where we're going here. I would say little things first. Big or small to big is the movement. Biblical principle, Jesus said about growth, he said, remember, before you can do big things, you must do little things. I'm going to trust you in small things. They'll grow into big things. We think exactly the opposite. We think, you know, I'm going to do this huge thing. I'm going to be the hero. I'm, I'm going to fast everything. I'm going to give it all up. 
And God says, no, no, do a small thing first. Learn to trust me in the small thing of life. And that can turn into something bigger. Uh, Dallas Willard, who is a man that writes about spiritual disciplines a lot, he said, say no to small things so we can grow into saying no to big things. Say no to what you can say no to. Say no to what you can't. Small victories turn into big victories. Receive the blessing of little things. Grow into larger things. That's always been the advice of the spiritual masters. God desires that we allow him to Cha- that we allow him to change us daily, and that's how fitting that is in this Relent series. So as we develop our fasting muscles, think about, maybe you're, maybe you're a person who said, well, I tried for three days and it didn't work. Pick something smaller. Pick something that's not so huge. Develop your fasting muscle in that. Start small, grow big, and we will grow bigger because we've learned to trust God in the smaller things. You can't trust God for the big things unless you've learned how to trust him in the smaller things. And this is God's desire that you learn how to receive the life that he has for you. I want to give you a scripture to rattle around in your heads and hearts this week. I love this passage of scripture. This is from the New Living Translation. It says it a little differently. Philippians 2, the 12th and the 13th verse. I'm going to start in the second half of the 12th verse. It says, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. The normal translation says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But verse 13 is what what I really want to stick in our hearts today. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power? You see, I want to, but also the power to do it, to please him. Take that home. Uh, Let let that rattle around in you. Uh, Hold on to that promise if you are doing a fast um, during this this time. Uh, Claim that promise for yourself that God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Amen.